How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm pretty much the same as I was three weeks ago, Jen. I'm living the Vida Rona. It's, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I know. That's I'm okay. Done. We I'm only done. have I'm like done. 76 more weeks of this, so we should be okay. Hey, but so you know what? Anyway, We're not here to talk about that. We're trying to. I was to... just going to say, I'm hoping you have something good. Like, we I do. hope you have something interesting to share so that Very I can escape my crazy world. I actually have another listener submitted. No way. I do. This is the third one. It's the final one that we have. And for now, for now, we need everybody to load these babies up and send them to us. I know you're out there not doing much. You're just sitting at home. Just ever thought that you might like to be a writer. I could write a podcast episode. I have uh, somebody from, I think, the Netherlands that is mm-hmm. writing one and we're chatting back and forth. And she's like, you know, this is a little harder than I thought. And she sent me a cute little picture of her doggo. The doggo was sitting with her. She's writing. Super cute. Super fun. So, hey, do it. You guys get all the... all the Glory. We'll send you a yep. shirt for yep. free for writing. And honestly, if there is a case in your area that you want to have known, send it to us. Figure, you know, write it out. Give us the facts, Jax, and we will... Read it, and we will have your name on everything. We'll put your name on our Twitter. We'll put your name in the show notes. You get full credit, so it'll be a writing credit. Perfect. correct, Amundo. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, Well, today I have one from listener Amy Felty. Hold on real quick, Jen. I was going to say, because I just remembered. Because the one that said that they really liked our show was because they really liked Pee Wee Gaskin's episode, and that was the first one she listened to. So awesome. I wanted to give a big shout out to Megan. Woo, who wrote Megan. That for us. And I was actually going to read it, and for some reason, I cannot find it. Sent us a private message and said that was her first one, and she loved it. Because of that one, she went back to the first episode, and then she had sent us a note during the second one, which was the Red Witch of Bokemba. Yeah, so Megan, look at that. Look at that girl. You got us a listener. Thank you. Go, That's Megan. So this one is from our friend Amy Felty. Now, Amy started listening to us because of our Peggy Reber episode. Oh, she is okay. from the town where Peggy Reber lived up in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, or she's close to that area. And she was actually one of the first ones to tell us what they were talking about with the bathrooms that were underground. Oh, but she actually was able to find pictures of what one looked like, and it was like all oh. fancy and stuff. It was amazing. Oh, so nice. anyway, she thought we would like to hear about another famous case that is from her area. Ooh. Okay. So are you ready? I'm ready. I'm excited. All right. <laughs> Today, we are discussing a crime that became an international sensation at the time that it occurred, which was in 1878. So this is an old story. She writes, even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, paid homage to the town and the sensational name given to the murderers in his short story, The Red-Headed League. Ooh. So the murders that we are talking about today are called the Blue-Eyed Six. It's a group of men who thought they had a foolproof plan to make money by taking out life insurance policies on an old recluse, Joseph Raber. They were assuming he was frail and on the verge of death, and they hoped for a speedy return on their investment. 
The plan formed due to the extreme poverty that gripped Lebanon County in Pennsylvania at the time. Four men, Israel Brandt, a tavern owner, Josiah Hummel, an unskilled laborer, Henry Wise, a coal miner, and George Zeckman, a farm laborer and a coal miner. All were married with families to support, but the only one that wasn't was Josiah Hummel. It always amazes me how there's, you know, there's always one idiot. And then maybe sometimes there's two idiots. But how do you find a group of six that think, hey, this is a great idea? Mm -hmm. Israel Brandt owned Brandt Hotel in St. Joseph Springs, and he had also lost one arm in a farming incident. Now, the type of insurance policy at the time was called assessment insurance or commonly known as, quote, graveyard insurance. The idea behind it was the insured paid a premium to join a pool. And when one of the members died, the rest of those in the pool were assessed a certain amount of money that was to be paid to the beneficiaries. For example, a thousand people pay an assessment of one dollar, right? So that way Mm -hmm. the beneficiary would be paid one thousand dollars. Them's maths right there. Like say you and I put an insurance policy on your husband and we each put in two (laughs) thousand dollars, right? And then we name us as a beneficiary, Mm -hmm. right? And so Mm -hmm. the beneficiary gets all the money that we put in. When that person dies? When that person that we insured dies. Okay. So to me, that is, uh, that's not going to end well for people. You're going to join these things and then going to, okay, one of them has to go so we can get some money, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a death pool. Yes. That's (laughs) what I was trying to. I wanted to make sure that I was getting that correct. That's terrible. Uh Uh-huh. I guess I'm assuming they don't do these anymore. I mean, it's been a long time since I've bought any kind of insurance policy. Hummel's and Zeckman's policies were worth $2,000 each. Brant's was worth $1,000 and Wise's was worth around $3,000. Okay, so their plan was simple. Well, in their minds, it was simple. Each man would purchase a policy on the 65-year-old Joseph Raber, who was a local man living in an old charcoal burner's hut. Now, the hut had a dirt floor, and it was located in the Blue Mountains. The hut was so small, a man couldn't even stand up straight when he was inside. So is this like a cabin, I guess, but I'm tiny? thinking it's probably, yeah, it's like, like a, a, a ram shack. He was poor. He, yeah. yeah. Thinking like the poorest of the Appalachian Mountains, but I could be gotcha. wrong. Yeah. Joseph Raybar lived in this little hut with his common-law wife, Polly Creaser. Now, here's a little fun fact that she wants us to know. Amy, person who wrote this, is related to the Creaser's side of the family on her mother's side. And she's oh. also related to Joseph Raybar on her father's side. So oh. she's got a little family tie going on to the story. Small world. Mm-hmm. Joseph Raber took on some farm labor work when he could get it, but still primarily relied on the charity of others. The four men promised to take care of Joseph until he died if he signed the insurance policies and made them beneficiaries. Joseph was happy to sign the documents for them. Now, Joseph was old, but he was also healthy, and he wasn't dying fast enough for these men. And they weren't happy because they had to keep paying the assessments on these policies to keep them valid. The insurance pool is basically more or less a pyramid scheme. So if anyone in the pool died first, like, say, Hummel would die first, everybody else would get the rest of the money. And then if, you know, the more people that died off, the last one standing is going to get all the money, right? Most times, members would stop paying due to monetary strain to continue in sometimes what may pay out less than what they had paid in. So, which is true if you're going to yeah. pay. So really, you need to open this policy, pay once, and then get rid of the person to get the most bang for your buck. Correctly. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. Yeah. Due to Joseph Raber's continued good health, the four men's payments were becoming a hardship for the already money-strapped men. And they came to the realization that they could literally not afford to let Joseph Raber live much longer. Usually meeting in Brant's hotel, the would-be beneficiaries began to plan Joseph's demise. Many plans brought forth were quickly abandoned, such as throwing him from a flat boat into a reservoir and poisoning him with chloroform, you know, all that kind of good Um, stuff. 
Mm -mm. Before decided that they could not do the needed killing themselves. They just decided, can't do it. We really can't kill him. We want to, but we can't. So at this point, Israel Brandt spoke to his neighbor, Charles Drews, who was a butcher, a carpenter, mason, and iron worker, and he was also a Civil War veteran. He had served in the 93rd Regiment of the Pennsylvania Volunteers in 1861 and 1865. So interesting, Drews was also married to Sabina Creaser, who happened to be the sister of Polly, which is who? Joseph Raber's common-law wife. Mm-hmm. This is getting to be quite small a lot town. of a lot of people, right? right? Yeah, mm-hmm. but small town too. So, like, I'm sure they incestuous. You know, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. she kind of kept it all. It's not like it is today, Jen, when you can just hop on a plane and go to Vegas and find yourself a man. It ain't gonna happen. <laughs> I don't think oh, wait, I want it can't it. happen now. Anyway, Brant promised Drews three hundred dollars, which I'm going to assume is quite a lot of money back in the 18. 18- that had hundreds. to be a ton, a ton, a ton of, of money. money. Mm-hmm. Promised Drews three hundred dollars to murder Joseph Raber, and it also promised the same amount from his conspirators after he did the job. So that's what roughly twelve hundred dollars. That's a how lot much, of money back then. How much money did they pay into that life insurance policy? It was different amounts. Remember, Hubble well, and Zekman did two thousand dollars each. Brants did a thousand, and Wise did around three thousand. That's a lot, though. You know. Back then it is, but remember, when you don't pay the whole amount, you just take out the policy. So anyway, Drews agreed, of course, and he also enlisted the help of his son-in-law, Joseph Peters, who declined, and another band by the name of Frank Stickler, a local thief. He's the one that agreed to help assist Drews in the murder of Joseph Raber, but he also wanted money for it. Mm-hmm. Of course it did. Nothing's for free, Jen. Mm-hmm. It is believed that Charles Drews was a thief in his own right and that he buried some of his plunder in an area around his home and in the area of Indiana Town Gap. But since the area is now a National Guard training site, you can't hunt for the treasure. Oh, that would kind of be fun to go out and try to look mm-hmm. for a buried treasure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you can't. Mm-mm. I mean, you can't officially. You can until you get caught and then there's troubles. So around dusk on December 7th, 1878, Charles Drews walked into Brant's tavern, declaring that Joseph Raber was dead. Earlier in the afternoon, Drews and Strickler visited Joseph and offered him tobacco if he would accompany them to Kreisler's store. Joseph Raber agreed, and as they crossed the simple plank bridge over the Indian Town Creek, Drews told those assembled at the hotel that Raber was plagued by an attack of vertigo as he crossed the creek and fell into the water and drowned. I guess nothing helped him have that vertigo a little bit, right? Well, she says here it should also be noted that the creek was only a few inches deep. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So that should be a little bit suspicious. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you can drown in just a few inches of water, but you mostly are incapacitated if you fall into it. If you fell and hit his head or something, maybe, mm-hmm. but okay. The following day, a coroner's jury examined the body and determined the cause of death to be accidental. Although the insurance policies held by the men was common knowledge and quite a few were aware of the murder plot, no one came forward with the information. Hmm. That's Shocker. interesting. There was an article in the Lebanon Courier that stated, quote, It is said that a person's in the vicinity hold policies of insurance on Raber's life for $13,000 upwards. There is unpleasant talk of all the probability of his death not being accidental. Two months later, the courier ran this headline, quote, The death of Joseph Raber. He is supposed to have been murdered. Six men arrested, charged with the crime. Due to some prompting from one suspicious insurance company, Lebanon County constables questioned Drew's son-in-law, Peters. At 4 a.m. on February 5, 1879, Peters admitted that he saw Drew's and Stickler drown Joseph Raber. While walking across the plank single file, Stickler in the lead, followed by Joseph Raber and then Drew's, when they got halfway across, Stickler turned, grabbing Raber by the shoulders and then throwing him into the water then held him under until he was drowned. 
Peters also informed the constables that the four men holding the policies had planned the murder. So that morning, Brandt, Humble, Zeckman, Drews, and Stickler were all arrested. The trial began on April 18, 1879, at the Lebanon County Courthouse. The trial generated national and international attention. It was the first time in history that six men would be tried together. That's interesting. Hmm. Really. I wouldn't think that you could put up to six people up on trial. I know Why you could would do you want two. To? I wouldn't want to. Because oh. you all have different degrees. Do you degrees get a choice of, of that? You all have different degrees of guilt, too, you know? Right. Plus, it's, I, I don't know. Yeah, no. Reporters from various different cities would come to the courthouse to report on the sensational story that captivated so many people. It was one of these reporters that would notice an odd similarity shared by all the men and coined the phrase that would make them infamous. It was observed that each of the six criminals had piercing blue eyes. From then on, the group was referred to as the Blue-Eyed Six. Ah, that makes sense. I was Mm -hmm. wondering where the blue eye came from. Okay. Mm -hmm. The trial was presided over by Judges Henderson, Rank, and Light. A total of 64 witnesses testified, though none of the six men would testify. The trial record is 247 pages of typed testimony, and since most witnesses were of German immigrants who spoke little or no English, the court would require a translator to get their testimony. Doctors, insurance men, family, and neighbors of the defendants were called. Could you imagine that trial? No. How? Mm, it'd be so long. It'd be kind of fun, though. It would be. The brunt of the damning testimony would come from Joseph Peters and his wife, Lena, Drew's own daughter. They testified that both witnessed Drew's and Stickler's drowned Joseph Raber as they watched from a second-story window of Drew's house where they were staying. Joseph Peters also testified that Drew's attempted to intimidate residents to stay quiet or pay the cost. Hmm. Threatening people with their lives, I see. Well, it's not like they didn't do it before, you know. Uh, The six defendants had five lawyers who did their best to deflate Peters' testimony claiming that it was impossible for them to have seen the murder from that second-story window, even going to the extreme of bringing the actual window into court. The window was a multi-paned variety. That's kind of weird if you bring a window into court. I was thinking, like, from the viewpoint, maybe a tree would be in the way or something like that. Yeah. But it seems like the window was a multi-paneled variety, and all the panes were too dirty to see through very well. And one pane was broken and had rags stuffed into the hole. So they were saying it was bad. They were saying that the actual window was bad. It wasn't that anything was blocking their view. It was just like you couldn't see out the window. The defense also called witnesses to testify that Joseph Peters had been drinking the whole afternoon and was likely drunk at the time he allegedly saw the murder occur. Oh. Oh, yeah. It was probably what he was wearing, too. The defense also tried to undermine Peter's credibility by claiming that he had personal reasons for animus against one defendant in particular, claiming that Peters was well known of rumor that his own wife, Charles Drew's daughter, Lena, had been having an affair with Frank Stickle while Peters was away in the army. Ooh, this is really full of gossip. It is. I love it. I love it. Other witnesses would testify that they had seen the men meeting at Brant's hotel multiple times conspiring about their plans. The trial lasted eight days, and the jury deliberated for only five hours before deciding on a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder for all six men. It's kind of something. Unlike today, where juries have a choice of punishments of life imprisonment or death, the verdict of guilty in the first degree automatically carried the death penalty. That's interesting. All six men requested a new trial, but while waiting to be sentenced, Wise made a full confession. At sentencing, Judge Henderson awarded Zeckman a new trial due to the fact that his involvement in the plan was based on statements given by fellow defendants, which would have been inadmissible had he been tried by himself. Drews, Stickler, Hummel, and Brandt would be sentenced to death by hanging. 
Wise would be sentenced later. It was assumed by the other defendants that Wise had made a deal, confession for a life sentence. This was not the case, as at sentencing, all the men but Zekman would be sentenced to hanging. The four men would issue their own confessions, trying to place blame on the other, quote, squealer, Wise. Stickler stated in his confession that Wise was involved in a plan to rob and kill a man by the name of Henry Hower. Drews put the blame on Stickler as the actual murderer. In turn, Strickler claimed Drews was the actual culprit. Most believe that both men had shared a hand in the drowning of Joseph Raber. So everybody's passing the buck here, I guess. Oh, yeah, totally. Normally, executions were performed soon after sentencing, but due to Zekman being retried, the hangings were postponed until after his trial. Wise and Drews were the main witnesses in Zekman's new trial, but their testimony was rambling and incoherent. Both the judge and counsel admitted both, quote, were all at sea. I don't understand that. All at sea meaning checked out? I guess. What does that mean? The jury found Zekman not guilty, wow, thus saving him from hanging, but his long imprisonment in the dank cells contributed to a respiratory ailment that would follow him for the rest of his short life. Locals, yeah, probably asbestos or whatever else they had back then. Locals, mold, black mold. Black mold. Sorry. Yeah. Or just, what is it, tuberculosis? Locals claimed his coughing sickness was, quote, the vengeance of the Lord, and he would follow his fellows into the grave on March 19th, 1887. Drew's and Strickler's execution was to take place at 11 a.m. at the Lebanon County Jail. Now, the streets surrounding the jails were crowded with people from all over the country. The jail yard itself was packed with friends and cronies of Sheriff Denninger, to whom he had issued 150 tickets. And most say he charged 25 cents per ticket to get in to see this. Wow. That's wow. way to make a dollar, I guess. Oh, yeah. That's a desperate times, man. Mm -hmm. I can't do the maths, but that's a lot of money, I'm assuming. That's like more I than 500 nickels, math, Camille. Yeah. <laughs> Neither men slept much the night before. Of course not. I wouldn't either either from nerves or knowing that they would be closing their eyes forever the next day and saw no need to sleep while they lived. At 9 a.m., four ministers arrived to give the men spiritual comfort and preparation. The cell block echoed with prayers and hymns. Drews could be heard singing and praying and even took a few minutes to wander the cell block to say final goodbye to his fellow inmates. Strickler was more subdued during this time. Mayor Henry Ernst of Harrisburg it's close to where my husband's family's from. Really? Mm hmm The chosen executioner interrupted just long enough to take measurements of the men to determine the depth of the drop needed for the gallows to ensure a quick and efficient death. That would always be, be awful. Ooh, they have to weigh you. They take your, which is make, hell in mm. itself to be weighed, let me tell you. And then, to, yeah, it just mm, would be horrible. But come on, you deserve it, I guess. Uh, Maybe back then. Yeah. Remember the minute. Oh, Jennifer is guilty to the uh -huh. gallows. And then you're immediately, there's no appeals for 25 years like there is now. Mm -hmm. At 1045, the sheriff shouted from the block for the condemned to prepare themselves. The sheriff and his deputy began the macabre parade, followed by the two ministers, the two to condemned and two more ministers, finally followed by the jail physician. A light, misty rain fell as the procession walked to the gallows. Religious ceremonies were performed in German, and as the clock struck 11 a.m., they were in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, at which point they began to hasten their words until finally ending with a prayer of benediction in English. The sheriff took over. He exchanged greetings with the men. What exactly do you say? How are you? That doesn't Hey, buddy, quite how's it going? How's life going? What's yeah. new? What are you guys doing for the holidays? Nope. Got plans? Nope. Got plans for later? The sheriff bound both men with leather straps, adjusted the rope around their necks, ugh, and put white hoods over their heads. Just before the trap was sprung, Drews cried out, quote, Frank, now we go to heaven. Now we go. Oh, Father, help. At 1108, they were pronounced dead, becoming the first dual execution in the county. 
Drews was buried at Mount Lebanon Cemetery, and Strickler was buried in his father's garden in Indiana Town Gap. Amy says here that you can visit Strickler's grave, which is located in a strip of land between two roads located in Fort Indiana Town Gap property. That's kind of interesting. It is, really. The governor denied the appeals of the rest of the men, and they were sentenced to hang on May 13th, 1880. One week before the execution, Brant and Hummel attempted to escape by boring a hole in the wall of their jail cell, only to exit into a high-walled jail yard where they were spotted, and then they were recaptured and placed in separate cells. On the day of May 13th, the streets surrounding the jail were filled with the curious men, women, and children of the county who came to witness the first triple execution. A new sheriff by the name of Harry Crawl presided though the previous sheriff, Denninger, played the role of deputy to ensure the smooth completion of the task at hand. Much like the last spectacle, there were religious services within the cell block for the men, a local tailor provided new suits, a woman, Miss Agnes Hartman, presented small bouquets of flowers where they were each pinned to their lapels. They got corsages? Mm. Wow. I guess. That's a fancy like execution. Prom. Very fancy execution. Then they were measured to make the necessary adjustments to the gallows once more. That's so weird. I never thought about that. Like that you do have to get weighed, I guess, Mm -hmm. because you need to make sure that the... Your neck snaps immediately. Because if not, you just... Terrible. Because they want the neck to snap. Because if not, you're going to choke to death. And choking to death takes a lot longer than a snap of the neck. Which is so horrible to talk about, but that's basically what it is. So Henry Weiss informed the sheriff that he was ready for his death, but he would like to go out first and say words before Brant and Hummel were brought out. Kral agreed and escorted him to the gallows platform where he faced the crowd. And speaking in German, Henry Weiss said, What I have to say is that all are guilty, as testified and confessed. I said all about it, who the first man was that spoke to me about the insurance and how Hummel got in. That is all I have to say. He had to have the last word. Reminds me of somebody I know. No, no, no. (laughs) That's me. Uh, That's me. As the minister began to sing hymns, the crowd and wise joining in, the sheriff brought out Hummel and Brant. The men kneeled for prayer, and upon rising, Hummel and Brant looked pale and on the verge of tears but wise seemed calm and collected. It was asked if there was any last words, and all the men declined. They were bound with straps, noose placed around their necks, followed by the white hoods. At precisely 11.15 a.m., the trap was sprung. So she concludes was this is the story of the blue-eyed six ends, and the legend and the ghost stories begin. This story has become a local focal point, inspiring a blue-eyed six whiskey. Wow a pub named the Red-Headed League, located in the building that used to be the Lebanon County Jail where the men were held and executed. There's a play, a documentary, and two books. There's also an attempt making a film of this story, which would be kind of fun. So ghost stories claiming hauntings in the old jail, which is now a farmer's market. Hauntings in around Moonshine Church, where Joseph Raber is buried. And she said many teenage rites of passage occurred near this church, me included, And in defense of my teen self, it's totally seemed reasonable to keep ghosts out of our car by locking the doors. Duh. (laughs) Ghosts don't know how to work locks. It's It's everybody knows that. Especially those electric ones. And and she says, and current self thinks teen me was an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Amy, if you only knew what idiot stuff Cam and I did when we were younger. But that was an interesting story. Could you imagine? no, I, I think, I wonder how long that that process of that insurance policy thing went on. Yeah, I'm not I, for sure. I seem to remember that I read something about that because it did go like that for a while. And then the insurance companies realized that, wait a minute, they're going to do this to knock people off, right? So it's right. kind of like a, you know, like putting in a pot to win the lotto money at school. Well, right. if something happens to them, then that more money for you, you know right. what I mean? Well, I mean, it's just there's a hard time enough of people buying regular insurance policies and then killing Mm -hmm. off people, much less Mm -hmm. getting a group of people in to 
purchase insurance for one well, And then wouldn't you be looking at everybody going, okay, all right, listen, okay, <laughs> who's going to be the last man standing? You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay, we all we all agree we got to take out the big guy, right, right. To, to get this, but I'm not sharing this with 20 people. Yeah. So some of, some of the rest of you got to go. Yeah, I can no, only that afford... That was really good. Yeah. That was good. It was very and interesting. I thought I had heard of the blue-eyed crowd, but I never read up on it. Or yeah. The blue-eyed... Yeah. It's very interesting. That's it really is. I like that kind of stuff. It's a neat part of the country. And like I said, Lebanon bologna is still amazing. And we are able to find something like that close to here. It's not bologna, though. It's like a sausage, like a salami, oh. actually. It's really good. It's smoky and it's it's just yummy. It's really good. So we always have Lebanon bologna. But anyway. you talking about that. Yeah, That's it's good. It's very good. Well, thank you, Amy. That is awesome. I'm going to get in touch with you and make sure that we get the size T-shirt that you want and what color. And color. And we will be mailing it to you so you'll get a happy little surprise while you are stuck in your house and all your awesome families and or pets can see you You wear the shirt. (laughs) Wear that shirt every day. And And make sure. The best part is nobody will know. Nobody will know. You wear it every day. Just your family. Nobody else will know. Whoever you're trapped with, your animals, whatever. So like I said in the beginning, that is our last one so far. We are always open to submissions. You can send it to our true crime podcast at gmail.com. If you have any questions about it or wanting to do it, you can contact us either by Twitter at our true crime pod or our Gmail, which I just gave you, or anywhere that you've on Facebook, wherever. Let us know. We would love to feature your story. Yep, I agree. It's interesting because half of these cases we would never have known about if it mm-hmm. wasn't for you guys. Well, so. that's small town. Ta- you know, like every area has something that's kind of unique to them. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So that's I'm Missouri, Jesse James. That's huge, right? Mm-hmm. So that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. not even just like Jesse it. James, like the small murders that don't make big no, times, I'm, you I'm know? Just saying. I'm just, yeah. I was trying to relate it to that one because it was an older case. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, that was awesome. Amy, thank you so much. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Thank you, Amy. Awesome Amy. Girl. All right, Jen, until uh, next week or next time or next time we do a stir crazy, whatever. Remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye. Love you. Which was in 1878. So this is an old story. Oh, this really one, old. okay. You might have been a teenager, Camille. That's really funny, Jen. It is. Thank you. Not <laughs> so. Due to some prompting from one suspicious insurance company, the Lebanon County Constables, Constables, not Constables, Constables. Let me do that again. From then on, the group was referred to as the Blue Eyed Six. Ah. That makes sense. I was wondering Mm -hmm. where the blue eye came from. Okay. Mm -hmm. At least it's not the brown eye. Oh. oh, oh, oh. (laughs) Sorry. Bad joke. Bad joke. My apologies. My apologies. My mind's in the gutter since I can't go anywhere. All right. (laughs) Could you imagine that trial? How? mm, It'd be so long. It'd be kind of fun, though. It would be. Yeah. Well, my sister Mildred said that, you know. <laughs> he saw Joseph down by the, he, yeah. Mm-hmm. Love small towns. It was probably what he was wearing, too. They are going to bring up what he, <laughs> did you see what he was wearing? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> bad joke. Drew's and Strickler's execution would, Drew's and Strickler's as, the jail road the jail road there's no such thing as a jail road but there is a jail yard the the jail house there is a jail yard oh that's funny so okay jim i know thank you camille and i went to vegas and you know we're really bad at math and we started off at like the Bellagio with putting in tons of money and we ended up at like the 
penny slots. <laughs> Remember, we just kept going to further, further, further down. Yeah. Uh huh. So we ended up at a one of the local dive gambling. Oh. I don't remember what it was called. Slots o fun. That's right. Slots o fun. How Slots can you forget that? That was the best part. I, totally walked forgot. in there, and it, that carpet was probably from like 1972, and it was just like that dank nicotine and like dry beer smell. It and we were disgusting. next to all the ladies smoking with their oxygen masks. Yeah, but anyway, we had a lot of luck. But the problem is. We would win like, oh, my God, Camille, I just won 500 nickels. How much is that? I don't know, but it's 500 nickels. It's a lot. It's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. Yeah, that's how good we are at math. I remember sitting next to a math math professor from our area, Wash U. He actually taught at Wash U, which is a very prestigious college here in St. Louis. And um, he asked me how Vegas was, and I told him that, and he died laughing. About well, because we want we was it you or me one of us I don't know on the nickel slots we ended up winning a bunch and then we're like wait this is only nickels so right nothing yeah and then it ended up at what it was like what four hundred dollars or something like that mm-hmm. I don't know it was a lot we're just but, bad at math yeah. but anyway all right back to the story religious ceremonies were performed <laughs> I can't the religious, religious ceremonies were performed in German that reminds me of the Muppets. <laughs> Amy puts that you can go visit Strickler's grave, which is uniquely located (laughs) on a strip of land between two roads. Nope. I didn't mean to laugh there. I thought it was going to say a strip of uh, a strip mall. (laughs) I was like, that's kind of fitting. But anyway, it's like you can visit. So my baloney has a first name. But it's not baloney. L-E-B-A-N-N-O-N. They're good. 